Uh, we have some, some feasting birds to start out today, a great blue heron uh, enjoying a big fish. Wow. And just swallowing that thing whole, just right on down, digesting all the scales, bones, organs, eyes. But, I mean, a fish still, you know, kind of soft. I mean, there are bones, but uh, here we have a, a female hooded merganser uh, doing battle with a crawfish that it would very much like to eat. Um, crawfish, of course, does not want to be eaten, but <laughs> merganser wins, and again, just swallows the thing whole, shell, uh, pinchers, everything uh, right on down. So that's a strong stomach on that duck. Um, one note to start out, Friday has a weird schedule. Um, so this class will start at 11.30 a.m. on Friday. So if you come here at 12.30, we'll, we won't be here. Um, you will have missed, missed the boat. Am I still allowed to come at 12.30? You can come to this classroom whenever you want. Uh, all right, any questions about uh, the lab, assembly, anything we've been working on? That's right. Yeah, so uh, you may have noticed uh, at the beginning and, and end of uh, functions you've been looking at the assembly for in the lab. There's been like subtracting some from, from RSP, function does stuff, and then any time a function begins this way, we also see the exact same amount added back to our stack pointer right before we return. And as I said, this is setting up what's called it the stack frame for the current function. And we're going to be talking about uh, how assembly interacts with the stack and how this interacts with procedure calls today and Friday. And uh, I think your question was, is this always eight? Or can it be other numbers? So uh, we'll again talk about the, the details of our next two classes, but the short version is this. This subtraction from the stack pointer allocates stack memory and this adding back deallocates it, and so this number is going to be however much memory the compiler decided this function requires on the stack. So if it's more, we're allocating kind of more space for local variables or other things that we're putting on the stack, and there may be functions that don't need to use any space on the stack, in which case we wouldn't have these subtract and add at all. Does that answer your question? Elliot. What, what's an indicator for how much memory a function would require on the stack? So, uh, as we'll talk about today, there are different things that we might put on the stack. And so, uh, that we'll, we'll get to exactly what determines how much, how much memory a function needs. Other questions? All right, so we're going to start off with uh, a bit of review. We have assembly instructions that implement a loop. And my question for you is, 
What kind of loop is this? Is it a loop at all? We're not sure what kind of loop it is. Please make a case to your neighbor about how, how we think about what kind of loop this, this would be. We've had some movement to indeed what uh, this loop will be under this description of the for loop is going to have some thing initializing some our loop variable. Where is a while loop or not? Where is a do while loop? We go into the loop once and only then do we check and repeat the loop if, if the condition is true. So, someone who thought this was a, a while loop want to share with us how you got to that, that answer? Jade? Um, so, we have a variable R where we have memory allocation RDI, which we are comparing to one in L2, and then we are subtracting from in L3. RDI is the register for like the first parameter. And so, my thinking was if it was. Um, Something that we were kind of assigning to zero before, and that would be a for loop, but because it's kind of like taking an input and then change the input, it would be a while loop. Exactly. That that our the quantity that is our condition and that we're subtracting one each time, that's gonna be our loop variable. And we don't do any initial we don't give it an initial value. So there's no four long i equals zero or or whatever it is. Questions on this? All right. Let's finish up with uh, the fragmentation about structs that we were talking about at the end of last time, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, memory and the stack. So at the very end, I had said the fields within our structs, so I had said that on x86, we're going to follow data alignment. Anyone remember what, what that meant? Silas? Uh, all the uh, chunks of memory should uh, line up with their multiple. So if something takes up eight bytes, it should start at a multiple of eight. Exactly. The, the address of some quantity A. something, the address that we, for the most, for the most efficient operations, we want to put every quantity that we have, long, uh, uh, int, pointer, whatever it is, at an address that's a multiple of the size of that thing. The reason being that our hardware is optimized to read and write memory in these aligned chunks. That it's going to read or write memory in, say, chunks of eight bytes that begin at multiples of, of eight. Which means if we have an eight byte quantity that's not aligned, that's split across two of these eight byte chunks, it's going to require kind of twice as many read a chunk or write a chunk to memory than if it was aligned within one of these chunks that the hardware likes to read. So x86 says, you can store things anywhere, but it's most efficient if, if they are aligned. So, in terms of a struct, then saw we have a struct S4. It has a character 
an int, and then another character. If we have one of these structs, our character C is going to come first, but our integer i needs to be aligned to a four byte boundary. So we'll have three bytes, one byte of character, three bytes of internal fragmentation, then four bytes of i, and one byte of c, but of d. So this three bytes would be called internal fragmentation because it's extra space that we've added to our struct to align the fields internally. It's also the case where let's imagine that we declare an array of these structs. So we say struct s4, and we put three of them in an array. We're going to have a chunk of memory that's this array, and we're going to put it, these structures going to be kind of one after another inside our array. And so in this scenario where the total size of the struct is nine bytes, one plus three plus four plus one. I have an index zero, and that's nine bytes. And if I put index one, if I put my next struct right after that, then my integer in this second struct here is not going to be a line. We have our C having I D. C having I D. And if we calculate out where all these quantities are, this I is fine. It's at, it begins at byte four, 10, Three more is 13. This I begins at byte 13, so it is not aligned to a multiple of four. So to solve this problem, where we want to be able to have an array of structs where within each array element our fields stay aligned, we also need to be aligned to the maximum size of among any of its fields. And so int here is 4, the other characters are 1, so this whole thing needs to be aligned to a multiple board shape. What is that word, uh, the word after fields? Uh, among fields. Among, thank you. <laughs> And so it, a total size of nine, not a multiple of four. So we will add three bytes. And when I say we, I mean the compiler. We'll add three bytes of external fragmentation so that our whole size of this is 12, which will solve this problem by Kind of making each struct, if we put them in an array, still be aligned to multiples of four sizes. And it'll only do this if it's in an array, though, correct? Or no, it will make every struct oh. of this type 
will have this external fragmentation so that they will be aligned if we put them in an array. Okay. So I'm kind of seeing this example here. Couldn't we have just made the internal fragmentation kind of between the C and the I one byte smaller and then it would align to the 12? You mean if we made the, the whole thing size 8 instead of 9? Yeah. Uh, well then, the I would, we need the, these three bytes to get the I within the first struct to be aligned to 4. But in the, at index 1, if you reduce it by 1, doesn't then the I start at uh, byte 12? I see. So you're saying we could dynamically adjust our internal fragmentation for each thing in an array to get them to be aligned? Yeah. Um, Yes, that seems like it would be a solution, wouldn't work in all cases, and it means that if we had a function that dealt with an array of structs, we'd have to, it would need to be much more complicated because it would need to account for all the different variations of where within structs all the fields could be. And our design decision, the design decision is going to be we want all structs of a given type to have the same memory layout. So we can just always have the same uh, code, the same instructions to interact with that struct and not have that be, be different. Yeah, Christian? We could get rid of a byte of an internal fragmentation, all the external fragmentation, if we just initialize both the characters first, right? Yes, so this is not, th th this is a bad way to do a struct with two characters and int, because it will put them in the struct in the order that we put them here, which means we can affect the fragmentation by changing the order of these fields. So if I instead said struct s5 and did i my integer, And then my characters, I would have four bytes of I, C, and then D. This is six bytes total. We still need it to be aligned to four. So we'd have two bytes of external fragmentation to get the whole size of it to be eight, so that we still have uh, the elements in the array aligned. But we go from a total size of 12 to 8 and get rid of our internal fragmentation. Status? Why doesn't the compiler automatically order them like that? Uh, because the philosophy of the C compiler is the programmer gets to do whatever they want. But like, it doesn't have any effect on like, the programming after that point. Like, once you make the stretch, like, you know, it doesn't, the order doesn't make any difference other than just the way you happen to order it. You know? Right? Or no? So, I think this is a, a, a reasonable point. Like, the compiler could do some optimizations on, on our behalf. Um, some of the design of the C compiler, which has been around since the 1970s, is based on the fact that uh, computers in the 1970s and 80s couldn't do a bunch of complex analysis of code and, like, trying different permutations of things. Uh, if we wanted compilation to occur at a reasonable speed. Gotcha. So imagine we have a struct with uh, 30 fields. Now to do this optimization, we have to like somehow explore a permutation of 30 things. That can be computationally slow. So um, I think there are, there are reasons why you would not want the compiler to do this for, um, in terms of the speed of performance. And if you just assume like programmers are going to like make good decisions, which not a good assumption, but uh, you leave it in, in their hands to yeah. deal with the, the fragmentation. Sam? Um, Starting with this, if there is internal or external fragmentation for a lot of They're both waste, equivalently wasted space. So uh, depending on our struct, some fragmentation might be unavoidable. Like, we just can't make a struct with two characters and an, and an int that doesn't have a bit of external fragmentation. But we can, we can minimize it there. Um, but yeah, we don't prefer one over the other. Oh. Is there a can you still use like memory that just like Oh yeah, C is not going to stop you from doing literally anything you want with memory. So yeah, you could, uh, you could put stuff in these, in these, uh, 
internal, internal fragmentation. Begs the question, why didn't you just declare those fields to begin with, what you're putting in there, but yes, you could definitely, you could do that. Uh, How is the external internal fragmentation represented? Uh, so, in memory, there are just going to be uninitialized and unused bytes. So this version of the struct, each of those, each of them is going to take out 12 bytes, and there are going to be six bytes total that we just don't use and don't ever read or write. And when it comes to the assembly instructions that are interact with the struct, recall from last time the offsets of where to find fields just appear in our generated assembly. Like we want to access the int, we know that it's four bytes away from the start of the struct. So we'll add four to the memory address of the start of the struct. And so the assembly will just take into account where the fields are, including with the fragmentation. And I think could be in there, we just never touch it. Exactly. Yeah. You know. um, so I already see this kind of thing, the like Java and Python. So any the question is, does, is C the only language that does this, or, or do others do it? Uh, any code running on an x86 system has this data alignment thing that it needs to deal with. So I have not looked up specifically what Java does with fragmentation, but I'm quite confident that it will need to do something to align, uh, align its um, uh, the, the fields of an, of an object because we still want to be able to, to read and write them efficiently. Other questions? Maybe the, the projector is going to, I don't know, take off, go to the moon, who knows. Uh, all right, let's do some practice. So, I have a struct. And as an int, has an array of three shorts. Anyone remember what a short is? Yeah, two byte, two byte integer. We have a uh, string, a pointer to a character as our third field, and then a float f. And this is not the most efficient way to design a struct with these fields. And so your task is to come up with Struct new, we'll still start with an I, but then want to do something different with these three fields. So I would like you to work out what those are and also work out what the size of one of these old structs will be. And what the size of one of the new structs will be. So work with your, your neighbors to figure out how we can make our old struct more efficient. All right, let's uh, let's talk through this. Let's let's draw out our old structs first because we need to figure out the size of it. So after our int i, we have our array s. Do we need any? Uh, Fragmentation between I and R shorts. I right, see folks shaking. Yeah, uh, where our shorts just need to be at a multiple of two, four bytes in, and it works. So we have and write S zero the first element and third. So and uh, two two two. So next we have our uh, R star C. We were backhammering today. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, do you mind shutting my back? Um, where do we need any fragmentation between our array and our array? How much do we need? Yeah, we need six bytes so that we have uh, at 16 rather than 10 for our R star C. Then our float, do we need any internal fragmentation before that? No, because we're at, we're at 24. Now we're at 28. Do we need any external fragmentation? How much do we need? Yeah, we need four bytes to bring the whole thing up to 32 because it needs to be a multiple of the largest thing uh, in it so that when we have an array of them, they stay aligned. So this whole thing <coughs> was 32 bytes. Questions on that? No. Why is there a array like x, y, and x, y, and x, y, Uh, because the syntax, like defining it this way in the struct, means include the array itself in the struct. We could have made this a pointer to a short, and then when we create the struct, we also need to separately allocate space for our array somewhere else, maybe on a heap. But declaring it this way is a way of actually putting the array itself inside the struct. All right, suggestion for what the second field in our new struct should be. Christian. Uh, float F. Float F. Already at four, so no fragmentation. No fragmentation there. Someone else want to suggest the next field after that, Eden? Our source. And we're already at eight, so again, no fragmentation needed. That needs our array as our third. Those can be already at multiple two, so don't need any internal. Do we need any external fragmentation? Yes. Yes, we need two bytes because this all is 22. And we again need the total size to be a multiple of eight. So, two bytes external fragmentation, and we've cut eight bytes off of all of these starts. Anything not clear about this? Any, any questions? Yes, sir. short. Uh, if we switch these two, then after the short we get 14 bytes in, but that's not a multiple of eight, so we actually need a bit of internal fragmentation, because our C would have to start at 16 rather than yeah. 14. So it would still be two, though. It's well, two. That's fair, yes. If we switch these, we'd just be moving this external to internal. That's a good point. Yeah. No, I don't think there's any reason to prefer one over the other. It's just the, just the total size of the structs we prefer to be lower. Other questions? All right. Let's return to a diagram that I have drawn before, but with a little more detail. This memory layout in this stack. So you recall from early in the course, we talked about our address space going from, thank you, always forget that. Uh, 
the low address is zero, ranging to our maximum 64-bit uh, memory address. And this address space is divided up into these different regions, uh, which we give different names. We have the stack, which is at high addresses in memory. And as we use more memory for the stack, it grows down. We expand it by moving this boundary to a lower address. And the stack will contain both local variables and information uh, that we need to facilitate calling and returning from procedures. And this is going to happen automatically, that the assembly instructions uh, we call a, a function, and this will generate the necessary assembly instructions to do everything that needs to happen on the stack. We have the, the heap, which we is what we use malloc to have a program request memory on this heap. It's kind of in these middle addresses, and it grows upward. And this is something that the programmer is managing explicitly. We only add memory on the heap by calling malloc. We only make it available for other programs or for future calls to malloc by calling free. And uh, then before I had labeled all the memory below the heap as static, but there are different sorts of things that go in there. There's static data like global variables uh, aren't associated with a particular function. So they'll be set up in this static data region when the program starts. Uh, any uh, literal numbers or string literals, things like that, uh, will be uh, stored in this literal section, and this, uh, uh, and below that will be the the actual code, the actual assembly instructions uh, for uh, for our program. Uh, you might have noticed when working on Lab Two that. Uh, if we print out RSP, it's some very large number, like 7 FFFFFFFFF. And that's because the stack is at these high addresses. And when we look at the assembly, the addresses are like 400, like hex 400, 582. And that's down in this low region of addresses where our instructions are stored. The final wrinkle that this diagram brings in is that these different regions have different permissions as to what a program is allowed to do in that region of memory. So for example, the instructions, we can't, a program is not allowed to change its own instructions. This is an important security feature that a program, once it's loaded in, can't start modifying uh, uh, the instructions, but this region is executable. We need to be able to actually load and, and execute the, the data stored there. All the rest of memory not executable, um, again, for security reasons, and we'll talk more about this after midterm break when we talk about buffer overflow attacks, the importance of whether memory is executable or not. And the other notable thing is this literals is for is read only. If we have a, a string literal or a constant that's, that the program never changes, we can put it in this uh, literals region of memory where it, where it cannot be modified. What are your questions on, on this? Silas. Is the read-only executable instructions, is that hardware enforced or is that software enforced? That's an excellent question. Are these permissions hardware or software enforced? Um, and they're enforced at the level of the operating system, but the operating system requires support from the hardware to be able to do this. Like for example, prior to x86-64, it was not possible to make the stack not executable because the hardware had to support checking these permissions. Uh, but it's basically a combination of the operating system and the hardware that every memory access is checked for these, for these permissions. And when we talk about virtual memory uh, after midterm break, we'll get into how the operating system is actually, how it's structured such that every memory access goes through the operating system such that 
uh, such that these permissions can be checked. Uh, other questions? All right, so let's talk about the stack specifically. And there are inst assembly instructions that I put up at the start of class. Or, sorry, I, I put up the add and subtract from RSP, which, we've, uh, which you probably have seen at the beginning and end of functions. You may have also seen something like these push queue and pop queue instructions at the beginning and end of, uh, of a function. And the effect of these The effect of this pair of instructions is to save the initial value of RBX, and then before we return, restore that value to RBX. So it's a way of, okay, this function is going to use RBX, but it needs to ensure that before it returns, it's back to the way it was at the beginning. And uh, this is what's called a Callee saved register. That means that a callee saved register is one that a function has to make sure it has the same value at the end of the function that it did at the beginning. So it either needs to not use it, or if it does use it, it needs to save and restore it. So that's kind of logically what this push and pop are doing. Uh, so what are, how are they actually Saving, uh, saving a value. And for this, we need to consider uh, what RSP, uh, the role that RSP is, is performing. So let's say that this is our stack. And This way is higher addresses. And by the diagram on the screen, we know that the, kind of the, the boundary of the stack, its top, is the lowest address because it grows into lower addresses. And so we think of the, a stack data structure where we're pushing stuff onto it or popping stuff off, but in uh, the stack region of memory is kind of upside down because it's growing into lower addresses and so the, the kind of the lowest address is the top of our stack. And we've been mentioning this special register RSP as the stack pointer. What that means is it the RSP register holds the memory address of the top of the stack. And so literally the only thing that determines how big the stack is, where the top is, is what's in the register RSP, which is why when we allocate space on the stack, we 
we subtract from RSP. We move RSP down, we grow the stack bigger. And to deallocate we add to RSP. We move it back up to a higher address that shrinks the portion of memory that's considered the stack. So this makes allocating memory on the stack really straightforward. We just move RSP to do that. And so for our push and pop instructions, <clears throat> They need to do two things. If we want to push something onto the stack, we need to um, set all. We need to decrement RSP by 8. We need to allocate, this is Q, we need to allocate 8 bytes on the stack. And then we need to copy whatever value we're given here to the location in memory where the stack pointer is now. So that means that when we push something on the stack, we move RSP down, and then we copy something there, whatever we're whatever we're pushing onto the stack. Sam? Why are we decrementing and not yeah, our, our, our stack is this in this upside down world, so to make it bigger, we move our pointer to a lower memory address. And so here, when I said it's saving the initial value, it's saving it by putting it into memory. It's taking what it, what's in this register and sticking it onto the stack. And then when we pop, We just do the reverse. We take whatever is at RSP, copy it over to our argument, and then we move RSP up by eight bytes to deallocate those eight bytes so they're no longer part of the stack. Okay. So it's push and pop essentially just like a move queue with a add or a subtract queue. Um, what side of it? Yes, so, so we could accomplish the same thing as this push and pop with move and add or subtract uh, instructions that did these two steps. So we just have a single, because all the time we're going to need to like be putting something on the top of the stack or popping it off, we have dedicated instructions here. But absolutely, a move and then an add or subtract uh, could do exactly the same thing. Uh, what, is, what context is the push to the pop queue used in? I get that the, uh, the uh, subtracting the adding is increasing subtracting the stack, but what's the push in the pop for? So they're doing this kind of two step process of if we push RBX. That means we want to take the value that's in RBX and put it onto the stack because we're saving it for later. Right. Because we're going to use RBX for something else in here, and that would overwrite the value. Okay. So we push it onto the stack. Now sitting here, RSP is moved uh, down here. We do all the stuff for uh, this, this procedure. This may involve doing other stuff with the stack. But by the time we get back to here, 
RSP is going to be back uh, uh, back where, where we pushed RBX, and then we'll copy that back to RBX and then move the stack pointer back. Why do you need to copy it? Uh, so, in this case, we want to restore the initial value of RBX. We want to put that back in that register. So, we want to take the eight bytes on the top of the stack and store them in RBX. Like, pop Q takes uh, an argument, and that's where we store the eight bytes that we're, we're copying off the top of the stack. Is that answer your question? So what happens if like, you allocate memory to a particular function allocates memory to set of those pointers that you have to do it? How it correctly allocate? It's like you have to allocate stuff on the top of it. So that's my point of the way to do the function. So if we, you're, you're saying like if we were also adding, uh, subtracting and adding from RSP as part of this to like allocate memory on the stack, uh, yes, we would need to make sure to do this in the appropriate Order. So you'll see that we'll push stuff on first, then subtract 16 more from RSP to allocate space for, uh, say, local variables, and then we kind of need to do it in the reverse order when we get to the end. We add 16 bytes back, and after this point, our RSP is back to where it was after we pushed, and now we can pop, uh, pop it off, and, and, get, uh, and, and it will be the, the right value off the stack. Other questions? Christian? Um, I think I see why the, the heap of the stack that broke into each other, just so you, they can both use that same bit of uninitialized space, but is there any reason why you stack these big one going from top to bottom like that? Could they be like switched positions on the address space but then have their directions reversed? So it stacks um, on the bottom and grows upward and vice versa with the heat? Uh, yes, I don't think there's any particular principle that says the stack needs to be at high addresses. Okay. This is just how uh, all Linux address spaces are laid out like this. The stack is always at high addresses, the heap is always at these middle addresses. We just need to pick somewhere consistent that they're going to be. Other questions? All right, so let's do a bit of practice. So, our top of the stack is at address 200, and the eight bytes stored at, at address 200 contain the value hex 20, so seven of those bytes are zeros, and one byte is, is hex 20. Uh, and if I do pop Q percent R8, what is going to change about uh, registers or memory? There we go. All right, please discuss with your neighbors uh, how you're thinking about what pop Q percent R8 is going to do. All right, there's been some movement. This will indeed change two registers, but no bytes in memory. Because neither of these two steps that pop Q does mention anything about changing what's in memory. We copy something from memory to a register, in this case, R8, and then we change what's RSP, changing another register. But what, was, what we have on the stack, this value hex 20, it's still sitting there. We've just changed the part of memory that we consider as part of the stack. That means the next time we say pop, push something onto the stack, we'll overwrite what was there before. But this, for example, is a way in which a C program when you have a local variable and you don't initialize it, 
it's taking up space on the stack or perhaps a register and that's, that is going to have whatever data was there before. When we pop something off of the stack, we don't try and overwrite it or anything. We just leave it there because we don't care. It's, or if we need that memory later, we'll, we'll overwrite it. Yeah. Is sub Q16 and Q16, is that what John needs to get? So this sub set <coughs> is uh, distinct from the push and pop. So to go through this, this whole example, our, our RST was at some point, then we push, uh, um, push RBX on the stack, this moves RSP down to here. Then we, this function needs some space on the stack, so we subtract 16 and move RSP down here, and then when we're ready to return, we add it back and then Sorry, so are the two registries that we're changing? I see that we're writing to R8, so that one is changing. What's the other register that's changing? RSP. So then we're incrementing it. Yeah, so when we we need to add 8 to RSP in order to move the stack pointer to have actually popped this value off. No, what we're doing is popping it, doesn't say increment after. Well, increment is part of what the pop instruction does. The pop instruction does two things. It copies what's at RSP to whatever the destination is. And then it changes RSP, it adds 8 to RSP. I'm going to explicitly write the sub Q and Q instructions. These are entirely distinct from push and pop. Okay. So when we push, we put RBX on, then when we subtract 16, that's another 16 bytes that we're allocating on the stack for whatever this function needs. Then when we're ready to return, we add 16 to RSP, moving it back up, and then we pop off. These are all, uh, these two things allocate space uh, for local variables for this function. These, this push and pop are, is what is saving the initial value. So, Yes, pop will do both of these steps, which will involve changing both the destination and RSP. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so if you have two pointers, and then with key, then you have to do the twice to the same register RSP. So your, your question is, if, if, if we have two different things that we need to save um, instead of just, just one RBX, uh, yes, then we would need to, uh, I think you see this in, in at least one of the phases, um, like RBX and RBP are two of these Kali saved registers. So we have push RBX, push RBP in the beginning, and then pop RBX, pop RBP at the end. Other questions? All right, just a few minutes left, so I want to uh, tease what's coming up Friday. So we've seen in assembly that when we want to call a function, we see something like call Q and then a function name. And when we want to return from a function, We've seen the, the RAT instruction. You might also see the rep, red instruction. This is no different from return. It's just uh, uh, a, I think, a kind of historical artifact in terms of how the compiler uh, actually generates a return. And one question we might ask is, do we really need special instructions for calling and returning, we have jumps. Couldn't we just use jumps? Since we can jump to the function we want to call and jump back when it returns. So let's imagine we have a, um, 
a function that uh, calls calls another function. So function one calls function two in the assembly in function one we would have at some point jump to function two. We know that it's just going to go to the first instruction of, of function two and start executing there. And inside function two, instead of return, uh, maybe we have a label like back. And we know that when we want to return, we just want to continue where we left off. And so our function two, when it's ready to return, just jumps back to where it came from. So this seems like maybe it would actually work to use to use jumps. But what if I change it to function one calls function two twice? Maybe we have two different calls to printf. Now we have like back one after our first call, and then our second call, we again jump to function two. We have a label back two. And we consider function two, when it needs to return, what label does it jump back to? Does it jump back to back one, back two? And if we wanted to do it this way, we would need to compile a different version of func two for every separate call because it would need to have a different spot it jumps back to in order to correctly return. So jumps are not going to cut it. We do need special call and return functions, and we will see exactly what those do on Friday. I have office hours 4.30 to 5.30, uh, and I'll see you then.